and welcome to the Business of Property podcast. I'm Stuart. And I'm Simon. We're both property people running our own businesses, and this podcast is just us chatting every Wednesday about anything and everything property, and hopefully providing you with a few informative snippets that might help you along in your property investing stroke developing journey. Either that or just depressing everyone. I'm or or just depressing everything, as, as I did last week with my travails around a, a, a tenant that decided not to vacate the property. But before we move into that, just another reminder that our guest, Stephanie Taylor, put forward a really great offer to offer the Rent to Rent Success book to anyone that leaves us a rating or review, snapshots it and sends an email. We'll, we'll leave the instructions in the show notes in this podcast. But really very simple, whatever podcast player that you're listening to, just go in, leave us a a, a lovely uh, rating. That takes one second and a review if you feel so inclined. Take a snapshot and send that to the email address, which will be in the show notes, and you will get a free book on Rent to Rent. Now, on to this week. And last week, as I said, we were talking about the challenges we had with, or I have with, a tenant that's that's not leaving the property and because of that the sale fell through simon started talking about something called torts t-r-t-s which we'll come on to but let me just give you the teaser that it involves people leaving live animals behind in a property and as a, as a landlord stroke landlady what would you do in that scenario well there is a legal framework around this which which i personally hadn't heard about which is why this podcast is informative as much to me as anyone else so, Simon, could you give us a quick overview of, of torts, what it is? I think I'm going to start by saying I am not a legal expert. Don't rely on anything I say. <laughs> Please do speak to a legal professional to verify anything. Um, this is just my understanding and my experience of, of having to deal with these situations. And torts, the, the interference with goods act, is covers all, all sorts of different things, but from a landlord point of view, uh, it is uh, mostly relevant for dealing with tenants' belongings. So, uh, the the particular scenario that we're going to talk a bit about today is when a tenant leaves a property but leaves their belongings behind. This could be at the end of a, a normal tenancy; they they might leave and give you back the keys and and all the, the good things at the end of a tenancy, but leave behind belongings. Maybe it's a bed, maybe it's something smaller than that, but, but they've left something behind. And it also applies for the, the more difficult situation where you have to evict a tenant and they leave things behind. Perhaps, in my personal experience, many, many things behind. So, so yeah, it, it can, can apply in, in a number of different situations, but it's mostly around dealing with the the stuff, the goods, the belongings that, that tenants might leave behind. So before we get too much into that, and perhaps Stuart, you can try and guide me through that and, and stop me getting too carried away with the story, because it could be quite a long one. Um, I, I'm curious, do, do you fear that your current eviction concerns might go in this direction? I mean, your, your tenant has been saying they, they will, will leave still, and you're, you're hoping you won't need to to start court proceedings in the next week or so, but if if you did, do you, do you foresee them being difficult and potentially ending up deserting the property and leaving things behind? I certainly wouldn't write it off. Uh, I think any, anything could happen, and the, the tenant seems to be well. As we mentioned last week, it's certainly not a clean, uh, a clean list of tenants, and has a lot of stuff. Dare I say is is hoarding. I mean, I think the, the, one of the only rare, on the rare occasions I've been there, just mountains of clothes were sort of covered by a blanket, I think, in an attempt to just show that they weren't there. So I think it's it's highly possible and probable that could happen. And, and as you were talking about that before, when you and I were talking about it before the record button, I was just thinking, you know, if you if you weren't aware of some of this stuff, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. You could accidentally just remove some things. Yeah, and that's exactly the problem we had, really. Both the unawareness and and the the accidents. So, the I'll focus on the unawareness bit first. When we were in this situation, we spoke to 
the the NLA as they were then, the helpline, and we spoke to the local council as well, to ask them what needed to be be done, and we got different answers. We even got different answers from different people within these organisations. So it, it does seem to be very unclear exactly how you have to handle these things and what responsibilities you you have to the tenants and to their their belongings. And to to sort of give away the end of the story a little bit, we did end up following some advice, perhaps with a, a cautious twist on it, and yet it wasn't enough. And and we we learnt learnt the hard way that that it wasn't enough. <laughs> So yeah, I don't know. Where, 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 where should we start with this story? What would you like to know next, Stuart? Well, well, let's start there. What was the hard way? What, what did you learn? Because that's, that's the bit, I think, for anyone listening, that's, that's probably the, the first primary focus. What did we learn? Uh, so the, the main thing we learned was be very careful what you do with tenants' belongings that, that are left behind, effectively abandoned, because you can't conclude that they're abandoned for a really long time. So the correct behavior with the tenants goods is either you don't touch them you leave them where they are you allow the tenant to come back and and have access and take them away if they wish or you can if you want change their location however if you're going to do that you need to be really really careful with it you need to make sure you document everything that's there you need to make sure that if possible that's either done by a, a professional company or it's witnessed so that you, you could record it or you could have a, a human witness or whatever, but it, but it needs to be verifiable that you haven't removed anything or you haven't damaged anything. Then if you, if you want the, the property back, so you, you want to, to use the property for something else again, you have to look after those goods. You have to put them in storage. And while in theory the tenant is liable for the cost of that storage, of course, in reality, you have to pay for it first as, as the person who's, who's needing that storage. So, so you can get the property back. You can empty it, but you have to do it carefully. You have to look after those goods as, as if they were your own. Even, even if they're ostensibly rubbish, you could possibly make a call on certain things if you want and, and sort of throw them away. And in certain difficult situations, like, for example, live animals, you, you obviously have to make some kind of call on those. You, you can't. You, you can't take a, a, a parrot and, and put it in a storage locker for, for three months. So, so yeah, you, you have responsibilities to these goods to look after them. And probably for three months. So it's quite a long time that you, you have to look after these things before you can really, truly consider them abandoned. And there, there might be sort of complications around that. If the tenant is, is making certain requests or asking for extra time or whatever, you, you can't necessarily just conclude that okay it's exactly three months we throw it all away so so yeah it's it's complicated it's difficult it may well be costly and yeah there are lots of difficult edge cases around things that are obviously rubbish or things that are are alive and yeah we had some difficulty navigating this (laughs) well i'm not surprised because because my my immediate approach before i knew about this would and i have never done this just to caveat it would be just to throw all of the items, excluding animals, into the garden and set fire to them. <laughs> I'm obviously being facetious, but I can think and, and sort of hear other people sort of saying, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, is that for the tenants as well, they need to be able to prove. So let, let's say, for example, they left a bunch of items in, in the property. As we know, if, if that's the case, where, and particularly in your case that, you, that you've spoken about, where you know, it's taken you forever and a day to get the tenants out. They've then left, stroke vacated the property, but left their stuff in it, and they're they're allowed to. And I mean, you know, it's just it won't just be my blood boiling when you you know as well as yours because you've actually been through it. And then we have to suffer the pain of keeping that stuff there in a property where we're going to try and rent it to other people. So no, that's not an option. Then I have to take their stuff and put it into storage and pay for it it's just quite crazy isn't it to think that i mean part of me gets it because it's someone else's property but then i think well if you care about it don't don't leave without it because you know that there's obviously a reason for that so what 
What happened with the tenants in that situation then? Did you ever hear anything back from the tenants in relation to the property stroke and or animals? So, yes, we definitely heard from the tenants. It was quite a long running saga, in fact. I'll try not to take too long giving a, a, a quick overview and, and shout at me if I do take too long, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the tenants left, thanks to bailiffs evicting them. They had obviously had lots of warning about this. They had lots of notice. They'd chosen not to get ready. They had to just grab a few clothes and they're, they're being evicted. They took their dog, I think, and maybe maybe a couple of cats they had, but they left several other animals, including a bird, and they got in a taxi and, and went away. And they seemed, from talking to them afterwards, they seemed to assume that they would still be able to just come back in every day and, and almost treat the property as their home still. But of course they couldn't. It, this wasn't allowed. Uh, we changed the locks. It was no longer their home. We were able to, uh, or should I say, one of the neighbours volunteered to look after one of the animals, I think. But the, the other animals, of course, we had to do something with. So we, we contacted Animal Charity and they had to, to come along and, and take these animals away. And of course, the, the tenants were then very upset about this. We, we'd stolen their animals and, and taken them away from them. And that was obviously sort of on top of existing animosity. So, uh, so yeah, this was a fairly difficult situation. What were the animals? Oh, now you're asking. I could, I could go back through court papers and work this out because it was all documented <laughs> for the court uh, for later stages in this process. But I can't remember off the top of my head. I remember there was a bird, but I'm afraid I can't remember what else there was. I think, I think there might have been sort of hamstery type smaller animals and maybe also a cat or two that they left behind. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's it 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 a small collection. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, more than enough that needs caring for, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and in actual fact, the animals were were kind of easy to actually deal with because we, we couldn't leave them behind. But they had to be dealt with. Because obviously you, you can't leave animals to fend for themselves because as domesticated animals and caged animals, they obviously aren't able to do that. And you're not legally allowed to euthanize animals. I don't think no. you've got a license for that. No, 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 no I definitely don't. <laughs> I don't think I'd have the stomach for that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, me either. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that had to be dealt with. But, uh, but the goods, the, the, the clothes, the, the furniture, the, the jewelry, the rubbish, there was actually just bags of rubbish as well that they left behind was, was actually sort of more complicated to deal with. And we spoke to, as I said, NLA and council, and we got conflicting responses from them, some suggesting we had to wait two weeks before we could do anything, others suggesting that we could just do what we liked, others saying, no, it's going to be a month. So we actually played it quite cautiously, and I think we waited about a month and a half before we did anything. Now, as in we, we left the, all of their goods in the house, and during that month and a half, we allowed the tenants to make multiple visits back to the property. They're all supervised, but multiple visits back to collect all of their goods, anything they liked. And they came in multiple times, as in three or four times, something like that, during this, this month and a half or so. And, and each time they, they'd pick up a few goods, a few, few bits and bobs, carry a bag full here or there, uh, and go again. And this is just crazy. I mean, it's making no, no impact on this. It, is, it's a, it, was, it was a house, so there was, there's lots of stuff in there that they were just ignoring. Uh, and then the, we gave them warnings, told them that in X days we were going to start disposing of their goods, and uh, and the, the date came, and, and we did. We started throwing away the things that we thought were obvious rubbish, other things we collected together that we thought um, might be sort of, of value for, for recycling or for giving to charity and things like that. We also found some things like sort of certain items of jewellery and things that we thought they, the tenants probably would actually really want. So we put those to one side as well, so we could specifically give them back. And we went, went through this process, cleared the house. It took weeks to actually get through everything. And some of the, the bits and pieces that the tenants did then take away, but most of it, they were incommunicative, didn't express an interest in wanting. And uh, and yes, we, we disposed of it and we thought, okay, that's the end of it. Well, that's done. Now we can 
redecorate and get the property rented out again. And then we received court papers. <laughs> this was the, the tenants making a claim against us for disposing of the property. And they, they were trying to claim, oh, I forget the figure, but it was, it was thousands of pounds. I think it was just under ten thousand pounds, something like that. Oh, lovely. So they, they were trying to claim for for, for the value of their goods that mm. we, we disposed of. <laughs> that, uh, that they decided to leave in in a house that they no longer resided in. Yep. Such was the value to them. Exactly. Yes, and, and decided to continually leave there despite multiple opportunities not to. And yeah, this of course upset us slightly and concerned us a little. So we then sought professional paid help we enlisted a, a solicitor who, who then actually sort of went through the law with us and and basically said yeah you probably broke the law <laughs> um because we we didn't have the the full documentation the witnesses and things for as we we sorted through all this stuff we didn't have the full logs of everything and most critically we probably didn't wait long enough before well we definitely didn't wait long enough before actually processing all of these these goods it should have been at least three months to be to be safe and we didn't wait that long so this was obviously a bit bit concerning and uh, the the whole process did actually go to court we did have to attend a court hearing and sit in front of a a judge and and explain things i I won't give away the result just yet but the oh you tease (laughs) the 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 some of the things that were, were claimed and were, were put in by the, the tenants were were quite crazy. So, I mean, they they submitted a list of all of the things that we supposedly disposed of that, that were theirs that had value that added up to this this claim amount that they wanted. Magical ten k, yeah, yep. And obviously, we went through this list item by item to actually check what was there, what wasn't there, and things, and. It was just a crazy list. I mean, they actually had items duplicated on it. Presumably they just didn't even check it. But but yeah, they had, had items duplicated. They had some items that we we never saw. We were absolutely convinced just didn't exist, weren't in the property. Quick question. Yep. Were the, these tenants, how, how much were they in arrears? Ha ha ha. For quite a long time, they had been paying some of their rent, but not all of the rent. And by the time they were eventually evicted, they were they, they owed us thousands of pounds. I I can't remember the exact figure, maybe six or seven thousand something like okay. that. Uh, this list of belongings, there were uh, there were some things that were in the property though, and were actually in sort of some of the, the things that we put aside that we thought might be important. So there was actually some of these things that we were, we were able to give back to them, or at least offer to give back to them and that actually proved to be more difficult than you would think if they were so desperate for them that they were putting in a court claim for them but but anyway there were some things we give back some things that didn't exist uh some things that were duplicated and of course the values of things seemed to be completely crazy uh many of them nowhere near as as valuable as as they claimed there, there was things on there like a washing machine. And yet, when we went through the house, we actually found multiple washing machines, all of which seemed to be in non-working condition. And yet they were claiming for, for a working, quite valuable washing machine in their, their list of things. <laughs> Just all sorts of really bizarre stuff. So they had a big list, not well thought out, duplicated. Yep. And because this was all going through the court, this was officially submitted documentation to the court. We had to go through and prepare a response to it, line by line, what we thought, what was duplicated, what was not duplicated, what was there, what was not there, what some of the things we'd given back already in, in their earlier visits, some of the things that, that we had available to give back, and, and of course, try and correct the values of things. And it took us days of work to produce our sort of response to the court. So this is just really, really tedious stuff. And of course, we we did then go to court, get to sit in front of a judge, and we, we had sort of two defences. One was that although we didn't meet the letter of the law, we did try to provide access, to wait a while, 
to to look after the goods and to to be respectful and see kept some things that we thought they, they might want back and things like that yeah it was quite clear you didn't do my approach and throw everything in the garden and set it on fire <laughs> no indeed <laughs> so that that was one of our defenses the other defense that we we put in was that the the tenant actually owed us all this back rent that as part of the eviction the courts had said we are owed but we had never tried to follow up we'd never actually tried to to claim that money from the the tenants so so we said well even if you find that we owe all this money for this the, these goods which we don't think we do once we do our sort of revised list we think it's worth much much less but even if you do the tenant still owes us more anyway in back rent by the time we we'd revised the list so so we had those those two defenses and uh, and yeah we, we went to court we we sat in in a, a nice nice room just with the judge well it wasn't a wasn't a fancy courtroom or anything just a, a sort of meeting room and it was very stressful but it was actually quite straightforward the judge talked to the tenant they talked to, to us they asked straightforward questions they looked through the the paperwork and yeah the the end result was that they actually just dismissed the claim so as uh, so yeah we went through an awful lot of hassle over a period of months we paid thousands of pounds to a solicitor to advise us that the solicitor didn't actually follow it all the way through to court because that would have been even more thousands of pounds. We decided to represent ourselves. I, I say we because I was owned this property jointly. Yeah. But, but yeah, so it, it cost us thousands of pounds in in legal advice, months of time and, and headspace thinking about it, days of effort actually preparing things. The, the end result is that in, in our own heads, we think we quite possibly did fall foul of the, the absolute letter of the law. But ultimately, it was dismissed, and the end result was we all just go back to the, the situation we were in before. Yeah. Uh, so there you go, a, uh, a long and laborious story with no real result. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was my final question on this, is so did you ever get anything back from the tenant with regards to the rent? I mean, did you follow that through? No, we just decided it, it's not worth the hassle. They, it, we, we know these tenants don't actually have money to speak of so there's no real point trying to follow up for the thousands of pounds when their their bank balances are probably in the hundreds I and mean, it's it's just it's just not worth it so you, d- you didn't put a ccga out or anything no no we didn't uh we had had quite enough of courts by this point yeah <laughs> well it's and, it, and i think anyone listening to this that that has experience would have had the same similar thoughts to me very early on in your story my thoughts were the winners here are going to be the solicitors because that's that's how it goes and, and not to say that they shouldn't because they're providing a valuable service because they're they're translating the you know the the legal information so that we that we can make better decisions but you know their, their time costs money and, and and like you said you you had to pay for that to get that solid advice because everyone's got an opinion but it's only when you when you have to pay for that opinion that that you can that you can hold someone to it and that's you know that's that's where it is and that and that's why the, these stories are so sad from a from a property investor perspective because you know no one won in that scenario you know you can even argue that the, the tenants themselves didn't win and, but all they've done is is cause you know it and, and this is where i think a lot of us get frustrated because you'd want the, the courts or someone to, to demand recompense from them whatever form that takes i'm not just talking about financials like well actually you've taken time out of the court you know the, the judge obviously has to evaluate everything that's been submitted you've paid uh, you know and they're doing this because they're, they're chancing aren't they and you know in, in their heads maybe it was maybe yeah we'll get a couple of quid or maybe we could just write off our debt by doing this who knows we can't get in those minds but that is why we get frustrated because sometimes for us it the law feels a bit lopsided and you know you know i've said it many times and it's quite clear you've approached this in a, a moral and an ethical way probably certainly a lot more than than i would have done and i can't say uh, on a recording exactly how i would approach many of these things but the lesson there is that we do need to be mindful of this because of people like that that, 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 that know a system you know i guess uh did they have to provide evidence of what they said was in the property, and could they? They had to provide what is called a, a witness statement. So this is is basically 
a document that you want to claim as true to the court. And of course, the more hard evidence you can back up what you say in this witness statement, the better from, from your point of view. So, for example, in our, our response to their, their claim, we included uh, copies of the letters that we'd given them, given saying we're, we're going to dispose, start disposing of your goods in the next days. We included uh, signed statements from third parties to prove that we, we had delivered these, these letters where we claimed and when we claimed and that these letters were, were correct or these copies were actually copies of what we delivered. So we provided evidence like that. On their side, if they had been able to provide evidence, so sort of photos, for example, or receipts or something like that, then I think that would have helped their case a lot. In actual fact, all they provided was a list and their, their personal claim that these things existed yeah. and, and no longer did. And, and this is where I'm going with it. And obviously, like you said, we, we're not liars. We certainly don't provide advice. If anything, our stories are warnings of what to avoid and what not to do, don't you? But this is experience. We're just sharing our experience. And I think in these situations, my feeling is that these people that are trying these routes aren't the sort of people that are cataloging, listing and photographing every item that's in their house, probably quite the opposite. But what if they were, and what, you know, if they do have receipts, I mean, that's the other <laughs> laughable thing. Where did these items come from? But the, you know, if they did have receipts and everything like that, and you'd, you'd thrown some stuff away, but again, I'd go the other way. Not, you know, if you're, if you're just leaving animals behind in a house, surely actually there's another counterclaim to say, you know, of you know, causing harm to, to animals. But we could keep talking about this for, for, for some period of time. But I think this is a really good episode in terms of certainly, as I said at the beginning, bringing to life something which I wasn't as well, I wasn't aware of, and I certainly should have been a lot more aware of it given the, the properties I rent. So it's, a, it's it's been a great episode. Any more warning shots to investors and property owners out there regarding this situation as a, as a final learning? I think just be careful what you do with other people's belongings. If you think they're abandoned, are they really abandoned? Mm -hmm. If you're not sure, just be careful. It's a lot cheaper to pay for a few months of storage than it is to uh, to pay for solicitors in a court case. Yeah, and I, I my rule of thumb is just document everything as as I've done as a tenant myself. Actually, just conversations, emails, get things in writing because unfortunately, when push comes to shove, whether it's the, the truth or not, is it we need that documentation just to put in front of someone, whether that's a court or an arbitrator. So uh, they're the learnings. We do hope you've enjoyed this episode and it's brought some value to you, as always. And if it has, share this podcast with someone that you think will find it useful and or leave us a, a rating or review. As with everything, we'll leave you relevant links in the businessofproperty.com website as well as in the show notes to this episode. Other than that, we'll see you next week.